Hello, this is Mrs. Popplewell again. We're going to continue to look at Chapter 11, the nervous system. Today we're going to look at the brain. The brain weighs about 1,600 grams. Now, what is uh, 1,600 grams? A gram's equivalent to the weight of maybe a medium paper clip. So if you could hold on to 1,600 medium paper clips, then that's about the weight of the brain. Uh, that is in, if you put that on a little scale and measured it in pounds, it'd be about close to three and a half pounds, 3.4 pounds. Um, it's a little heavier in men than it is in, in women. It functions to interpret sensations and determines perception, stores memory, is the center for reasoning, helps you to make decisions and coordinate muscular movements, helps to regulate your, the activity of your organs, and determines your personality. The major parts is, are the cerebrum with two, the right and left hemispheres of the cere cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brainstem, and the cerebellum divided up into two cerebellar hemispheres. There are two hemispheres of the cerebrum. They're collectively called the cerebrum. That's this area here. The convolutions are these bumps. It's also called gyra, and separating those convolutions are these grooves called sulci. Well, sulci, sulci is plural for sulcus. Um, the right and left hemispheres of the cerebrum are separated by the longitudinal fissure, a very deep groove. Remember, a sulcus is not deep. A fissure is, so the longitudinal fissure separates right and left hemispheres of the cerebrum. It goes all the way down to the corpus callosum, which is a solid part that when you dissected the sheep's brain, you know, you could separate out the right and left halves with the, through the, putting your thumbs into the fissure, but you had to cut the corpus callosum because it's one solid piece that holds together those two hemispheres. You have the transverse fissure right here separates out the cerebrum from the cerebellum, so the transverse fissure separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum and then the longitudinal fissure separates the right and left halves of the cerebrum. The two hemispheres of the cerebrum makes up about 83 percent of the brain's total mass. It has three basic regions, the cerebral cortex, most of your, the action or the potential of the brain processes happen in the cerebral cortex, so it's very important. This outermost layer of the brain tissue, the cerebral white matter, it's the deeper, all of this are deeper brain tissue. There's basal nuclei that we'll discuss later. Each hemisphere has contralateral innervation. So what that means is that these two hemispheres, contralateral, go the innervation or the nerves or tracks in the central nervous system go from one lobe to the other. Each hemisphere is concerned with sensory and motor functions of the opposite side of the of the body. So you've heard of people who had a brain injury on in the right hemisphere and it affects the action of the left side of the body. If they had um, injury, say brain injury to the left lobe of the cerebrum, then it would affect the right side of the body. If you know, if you remember the bones of the skull, you can tell me the lobes of the cerebrum. 
as you put your hand above the orbit or the eye socket and just lay it on your forehead, your fingers, your hand would pretty much cover the frontal lobe underneath the frontal bones of the skull. Okay? This, remember that uh, the very shallow groove or sulcus, the central sulcus, separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And then you have the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe, and if you can move that temporal lobe a little bit, you would see the insula. Okay, there's the cerebellum, the cerebrum. The functions of the cerebrum is for interpretation of information, initiating voluntary movements, so voluntary muscle control, storing a memory, and then retrieving that memory for reasoning, and it is the center for intelligence and personality. The functional regions of the brain the cerebral cortex is a thin layer of gray matter that constitutes the outermost portion of the cerebrum. So this portion here, the outermost portion, it contains 75% of all the neurons in the central nervous system. It enables you to perceive, to communicate, to remember, to understand, to initiate volunteer muscle movement, to initiate consciousness. So you have all these functional areas of the brain. Up in the lab you had a model that was color, colored very similar to this one and you learned the functional area of the brain. So there are three kinds of functional areas. One of that is the motor function. You have the primary motor areas and the frontal lobe helps to control voluntary muscles. So this area here is the motor area involved in control of voluntary muscle movement. The brocus area is anterior to the primary motor cortex. So the brocus area is right here. It controls motor speech. It usually is found in one hemisphere. It controls the muscles needed for speech. So here's the deal. If you have brain injury in this area of the brain, a stroke or a closed head injury or swelling of the brain and it causes brain damage in this area, the brocus is usually uh, in um, one hemisphere and not in both hemispheres. So if you lose the ability to speak, you cannot train the brain in the other hemisphere to do that task. There are some, like some motor functions, can be retrained if there's damage to this area by uh, cognitive therapy and physical therapy can retrain the brain for motor function, but since the brocus is in, in only one of the hemispheres, it's pretty serious if you have damage to that area. And you have to realize that a person who is suffering with this damage may have full function, other function of the brain, so they're thinking and they're trying to form those words, but they're unable to, even though the words are in their brain, they're not able to speak the words, so it's pretty frustrating. It controls the muscles needed for speech. The frontal eye field is above the brocus area and it controls voluntary movement of the eyes and of the eyelids. Now, you don't really have to remember this, but I thought it was pretty interesting where it gives you all the functional areas of the brain and here's motor function and then the yellow there would be sensory, the sensory area. So motor and then the sensory area.
By the way, if there is da damage to the brocus and a person is unable to speak, that is called aphasia. A-P-H-A-S-I-A. -A -S -S aphasia. Let me see if I can write that here. Oh, no, it didn't let me do that. didn't work. Oh well. Alright, so um, aphasia is the loss of speech. A-P-H-A-S-I-A. -A. The sensory areas. You have the cutaneous sensory area. Here is the uh, sensory involved in cutaneous and other sensory Cutaneous would be touch. Interpret sensation on the skin. That hot and cold. Um, light touch, deep pressure, um, pain receptors, etc., etc. The visual area is in the occipital lobe. The visual area helps you to um, interpret the vision, what you are seeing, and that's in the occipital lobe. Auditory area. The auditory area helps you to interpret hearing, and that is found right here in the area very close to where you have an ear, um, in the superior temporal lobe. And again, that's showing you the same areas, the sensory areas. Association areas, the regions of the cortex that are not primary motor or primary sensory areas. It's widespread throughout the cerebral cortex. It analyzes and interpret, interprets sensory experiences. It provides memory, reasoning, verbalization, judgment, and emotions. So that is the um, association areas. You need to remember this in the association area. Now, um, what does it mean to do all these things? Well, just think about this. So you are seeing a flame. You are smelling smoke. You are feeling the heat from a fire. So your brain helps you to interpret that information in the association area of your brain. So do you move closer to the fireplace to get warm or to the campfire? Or is your house on fire and you need to grab your animals and grab your purse and run out the front door or in your cell phone so you can call the fire department? You interpret all that information that you have from memory and making good judgment and from past experiences. So this is how the association area works. It associates and communicates between the sensory and motor areas. Again, uh, in these areas, uh, it's also called the Wernicke's area that helps with Brocus with the speech. In the Wernicke's area here, generative interpretive area so it helps you to interpret like I was saying all the information that you were uh, you received it also helps with speech um, in the Wernicke's area so association area know these what they do Again, aphasia is the loss of speech. Uh, uh, more association areas. The frontal lobe association areas helps with concentrating, planning, problem, problem solve, solving, and judging. 
Now what does that mean? Well, damage to the frontal lobe. You've heard recently about the NFL players that have uh, brain damage from all the blows to the brain where some teams are actually putting sensors inside the helmet. In high schools they're doing this also. Sensors inside the helmet that tells when the there is a blow to that helmet which means that there's a blow to that brain that's inside that helmet uh, so that there is not damage or to prevent damage if there's a blow to the head then that player needs to sit out for a while so that the brain can recuperate um, and if there is frontal lobe damage then uh, a person could use poor judgment needs to attend probably anger management classes and it's usually when um, the um, discernment is affected and making good decisions like I said um, losing one's temper and making good judgments in um, deciding what to do in a stressful situation all is is affected by frontal lo the frontal lobe the parietal lobe association areas understanding speech and using words to express thought the temporal lobe association areas remembering visual scenes scenes music and complex patterns The occipital lobe association area combine the visual images with other sensory experiences. And over 90% of the population, the left hemisphere is dominant. Now let's, I'm going to break that down a little bit further here. 90% of the population is, is um, left hemisphere dominant. 90% of those people are right-handed and about 64 are left-handed that are left hemisphere dominant. Now the right hemisphere dominant, about 10% of right-handed people are right hemisphere dominant and about 20% of left-handed people are right hemisphere dominant. Equal dominance is found in the remaining 16% of the left-handed people. Okay, dominant hemisphere controls speech, writing, reading, verbal skills, analytical skills, and computational skills. The non-dominant hemisphere controls nonverbal tasks, motor tasks, understanding and interpreting music and visual patterns. It provides emotional, intuitive thought processes. Memory, short-term memory and long-term memory. Long-term would be like childhood memories, remembering one's childhood, short-term. Um, let's talk about that for just a minute. So you're working in a healthcare situation and you go in and that patient says you didn't bring me my lunch even though a few minutes ago you picked up their tray and took it back out to the hallway to put on the rack to be taken to the kitchen to be cleaned and um, you explain to them that yes you did eat just a little while ago and and um, then you leave the room and come back in a few minutes and they're asking where their lunch is or even maybe even their breakfast. They do not remember what they ate just a few minutes ago. That is short-term memory. It is working memory. It is closed circuit. The circuit is stimulated over and over and over and over. When the impulse flow stops, the memory disappears. So people who are suffering from memory loss, the short-term memory goes first. That same person who can't remember that they ate lunch a few minutes ago may tell you a story about their childhood or a story where they were in the Korean War and they were on a battleship and um, all the things that the experiences they had 
as a child uh, growing up in the country. They can tell you all these stories, but yet that they, they cannot remember that um, they went to the restroom a few minutes ago and they're expecting you to escort them to the restroom again. So that is short-term memory. It, um, a lot of times they can't remember 10 minutes before and there's actually been studies on people uh, walking into buildings, short-term memories. You're walking into a building that you don't walk into every day. A person who walks through a front door, say that front door is painted, you ask them 10 minutes later, later what the color of the door was that they walked into 10 minutes ago and they're usually that memory will disappear within 10 minutes and they usually cannot describe what that front door looked like. Long-term memory would be the same if you worked in that building and you went through that, that door every day over a long period of time, it builds the lasting memory. And so short-term memory is short-lived and long-term memory is um, actually changes neurons so that you can remember things. Now I would recommend that you look at page 430 and the table 11.10 tells you the effects of the autonomic stimulation on various visceral effectors. Um, it would be very good to look over this so that you would know how the, the response of the sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation, um, the, res the um, of course the sympathetic as I said before is under stressful situations and the parasympathetic is action during the normal time and the effect on those different organ systems uh, with, from actions from the sympathet sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. I'd look over that chart. It's pretty interesting. But we're going to move on and talk about basal nuclei. A nucleus is a bundle of nerve cell bodies. Remember in the spinal cord and the peripheral nerves, the bundle of Soma or cell bodies is called a ganglia. Within the brain it is called the nucleus or the uh, central nervous system is called the nucleus. It's masses of gray matter. It's deep within the cerebral hemispheres, the caudate nucleus, pedimen, and globus pilatus. Remember those you're going to not have to tell me a whole bunch about the nuclei, but remember those three terms as the basal nuclei. Caudate nucleus, pedimen, and the globus pilatus. It produces dopamine. It controls certain muscular activities. It's also called the sub cortical nuclei or basal ganglia, subcortical nuclei or basal ganglia, a concentration of, a, of soma or cell bodies in the central nervous system. It helps to initiate, stop, and regulate intensity of many muscular movements which are directed by the primary motor cortex. The nuclei sends output to the cortex through relays with the thalamus. There is no direct access to the motor pathway, so it has to go through the thalamus to get there. The caudate nucleus, pedimen, and globus pilatus is part of the basal nuclei or basal ganglia or subcortical nuclei. The diencephalon. This is in the central core of the forebrain. It is surrounded by the cerebral hemispheres of the cerebrum. 
it's between the cerebral hemisphere and the brain stem. It surrounds the third ventricle. Okay, the third ventricle is in this area. It is made up of the thalamus, and this is the thalamus here. As you go deeper, the hypothalamus, the optic tracts, and these are the optic tracts, and where these tracts cross is the optic chiasma, and then you would have the uh, if as okay thalamus hypothalamus as you continue uh, this is posterior anteriorly here's the pituitary gland you can't really see the the infundibulum here because that is the stalk the little uh, structure or stalk that holds the posterior posterior pituitary gland okay infundibulum holds the posterior pituitary gland and then you have these mammillary bodies on either a little uh, posterior to and a little inferior to the pituitary gland and then posteriorly you have the pineal gland the thalamus is just above the infundibulum The hypo, uh, the in, uh, let me go back. The you have the infundibulum that holds the pituitary, and then from there you would go up, and it would be the hypothalamus is it just just above the infundibulum. It is below the thalamus. It's inferior, sort of anterior to the thalamus. It its function is visceral control. It is the cent center of visceral control. It helps to regulate homeostasis. The hypothalamus helps to regulate homeostasis. It integrates the autonomic nervous system. It uh, has some function of controlling the endocrine system, heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, water and electrolyte balance hunger body weight control of digestive movements and secretions regulation of sleep wake cycles control of endocrine system functioning and the epithalamus will I will get there in just a minute let's go over this chart and then we'll look at those functions on the next slide okay so thalamus the hypothalamus is more anterior and inferior to the thalamus. Now, part of the diencephalon is only the posterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland is not part of the diencephalon. the posterior pituitary only so remember that posterior pituitary part of the th diencephalon thalamus hypothalamus posterior pituitary and all these others the thalamus is the gateway for sensory impulses heading to the cerebral cortex so it is a pathway for those uh, that information it receives all sensory impulses except for smell it channels the impulses to the appropriate a area of the cerebral cortex for interpretation and then action. Hypothalamus again maintains homeostasis by regulating visceral activities. It links the nervous and the endocrine systems. Now I'm going to go again, go over again what the hypothalamus does. It controls. It's the main visceral control center of the body regulates homeostasis, integrates autonomic nervous system, controlling heart rate, blood pressure, regulates body temperature, water and electrolyte balance. It is a control center for hunger and body weight, for digestive movements and secretions.
regulations of sleep-wake cycles, control of the endocrine system functioning. Then the epithalamus is the region above. Epi means above the thalamus. It's involved in regulation of sleep-wake cycle or mood. The pineal gland secretes melatonin hormone and also contains one of the choroid plexus that produces cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. The limbic system consists of the portions of, portions of the frontal lobe, portions of the temporal lobe, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, basal nuclei, and other deep nuclei. Now its function is controlling emotions, producing feelings, and interpreting sensory impulses. The limbic system, system is involved in emotional response. Also includes structures in the frontal temporal, frontal lobes and the temporal cortex, basal nuclei, as I listed just a minute ago. Controls emotional experience and expression. It can modify the way a person acts. It produces feelings of fear, anger, pleasure, and sorrow. It recognizes, helps the person recognize life-threatening upsets in their physical and psychological world. And it helps them to counter these things. And also, it is involved with the sense of smell. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but the olfactory bulbs, the olfactory tract, is the only cranial nerve that gives direct access to the limbic system, to the brain. It takes the information directly to the, the brain so with the limbic system and smell, smells can trigger an emotional response. If you bought your grandmother her favorite perfume every year for Christmas, your, in, your grandmother passed away five years ago, but you're in the store shopping for Christmas and an elderly lady walks by with that same perfume and you smell that perfume it immediately will cause an emotional response smell is directionally or uh, directly associated with emotions the brain stem has many autonomic functions. It is an important relay station or pathway. The brain stem serves as the pathway for fiber tracks running to uh, the brain with sensory impulses and from the brain with motor impulses. That's directly to the cerebrum so pathway tracks ascending tracks with sensory impulses to the cerebrum and descending tracks from the cerebrum to the brain stem for motor impulses it and it is the site where many cranial nerves arise and those cranial nerves again are part of the peripheral nervous system the brain stem is made up of the midbrain the pons and the medulla oblongata now here is the spinal cord. The medulla oblongata gives rise to the spinal uh, gives rise to the spinal cord. So the medulla oblongata, the pons, and then the midbrain is in this area. So this is the anterior view. The medulla oblongata. Uh, this is posterior to the pons where the cerebral peduncles are and then the midbrain now in this area where you have the midbrain the posterior view when you looked at the at the sheep's brain you were able to see the corpora quadrigemina the body of four with the superior 
caniculus and the inferior caniculus and um, those areas. The midbrain pons and medulla oblongata. Let's look at the midbrain first. It's between the diencephalon and the pons. So this area, this area here is the area of the midbrain. It would be here, right above, superior to the pons. It conducts a pathway between the higher and lower brain. It has visual and auditory reflexes. It also the, contains areas associated with the reticular formation. Now, reticular formation stimulates the uh, cerebral cortex into a state of wakefulness. Okay, I'll talk about that again in just a minute. Okay, it um, contains fun bundles of fibers that join lower parts of the brain stem and the spinal cord with the higher part to the brain. It contains a cerebral aqueduct. That's the tube that leads from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle to the from the fourth ventricle to the central canal. It has bundles of nerve fibers and it has the corpora quadrigemina, the upper two um, bodies of the corpora quadrigemina is for visual reflexes and the lower two auditory. Okay, upper two visual, lower two of the corpora quadrigemina is for auditory reflexes. The pons is the rounded bulge on the underside of the brainstem, this rounded bulge here. It is between the medulla oblongata in the midbrain. It helps to regulate rate and depth of breathing. Autonomic nervous system breathing, the rate and depth of breathing. It relays it relays nerve impulses to and from the medulla oblongata to the cerebellum. So it relays impulses from the medulla oblongata to the cerebellum. It conducts oh, okay, that's the pons. It's the bulging portion of the a brainstem. It is the bridge or pathway of conduction of tracks. It is the location of the pneumotaxic area. Pneumotaxis, taxic. The regulation, a regulate, regulation of breathing rate, the rate of uh, respiratory rate, and of the respiratory center. It also contains areas associated with the reticular formation. Again, state of wakefulness, stimulating the cerebral cortex into a state of wakefulness is what the um, reticular formation does. Pneumotaxic area in the pons. The medulla oblongata. Make sure that you know these italicized areas. The medulla oblongata is the enlarged continuation of the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is here, the medulla oblongata is here, the pons and the midbrain. It is the conduction pathway for ascending and descending impulses between the brain and the spinal cord. It contains the autonomic reflex center for cardiac, vasomotor, respiratory control centers. It contains various non-vital reflex centers such as coughing, sneezing, vomiting. So a person that has major brain damage who may be on life support can still, well not necessarily uh, cough with a tube in their mouth, but they can try. Sneezing and vomiting can happen even though they're not awake because those are reflexes. Yawning too, by the way. All right, uh, 
make sure that you know the italics. It helps the hypothalamus control heart rate and blood pressure, so it helps the hypothalamus maintain homeostasis. Has the respiratory center that helps control the rate and depth of breathing. It works with the pons and the hypothalamus. Remember the pons with the pneumotaxic center? Well, the medulla oblongata assists the pneumotaxis center. Pneumotax. Reticular formation. So the reticular formation, you have an area here in the brain stem that from the medulla to the pons and then a little bit of area um, anterior to the corpora quadrigemina, which is all part of the midbrain here. Okay. It's a complex network of nerve fibers scattered throughout the brainstem. It extends into the diencephalon, connects the centers of the hypothalamus, the basal nuclei, cerebellum, cerebrum. It filters incoming sensory information and it arouses the cerebral cortex into a state of wakefulness. Tiny islands of gray matter that filters incoming sensory impulses. Reticular formation, tiny islands of gray matter that filters incoming sensory impulses. It controls up the brain alertness. If it's inhibited, sleep. It's inhibited when you're asleep. Also, inhibiting it would be alcohol and tranquilizers. So say you have brain stem injury with a um, brain injury. Okay, and there's, it would affect all those autonomic nervous system regulatory systems. But the reticular formation sends information to the cerebral cortex, cortex and stimulates it into a state of wakefulness. So if you have swelling of the brain, it puts pressure on the brain stem and it affects the reticular formation and it's not able to stimulate the cerebral cortex into a state of wakefulness. What are we talking about here? Yep, somebody said it. Coma. So at the opposite of a state of wakefulness in the cerebral cortex is coma. Now you can have it in sleep, but coma. Types of sleep. Let's talk about that. Slow wave happens when a person is tired. It decreases the activity of the reticular system. It's very restful. It's dreamless. There is reduced blood pressure and respiratory rate. It ranges from light to heavy. It alternates with REM sleep. What's REM? Rapid eye movement. Some areas of the brain are active. Heart and respiratory rates are irregular, and this is the time when dreaming occurs. The REM sleep has only certain areas of the brain are active at any time. It's responsible for dreaming. It usually alternates with the slow wave. It lasts only about 15 minutes usually. And some people think that during this time is how the brain helps you to uh, work through your problems. But the research is still out on that. The cerebellum. This is the area of the cerebellum. It's inferior to the occipital lobe. It's posterior to the pons and medulla oblongata. It has two hem hemispheres, just like the cerebrum. It has two hemisphere hemispheres separated by the vermis. The vermis connects the two hemispheres. Okay, so um, the vermis is the separator of the two hemispheres. As you cut through the vermis, you will see gray matter and then within the gray matter you will see um, white matter and it looks like 
the branches of a tree, the white matter against the gray, and that's where it gets its name, Arbor Vitae, the tree of life, Arbor Vitae, is that white matter within the cerebellum. The cere you have the cerebellar peduncles, those are nerve fiber tracts. The dentate, dentate nucleus, the largest nucleus in the cerebellum, and remember a nucleus is a bundle of cell bodies. It helps you to integrate sensory information concerning position of body parts. So it works with the inner ear in giving you coordination and balance. It coordinates skeletal muscle activities and helps you maintain posture. So um, a layup in basketball to coordinate the, the hands while dribbling that basketball and going up for a layup, but the majority of the movements here are coordinated by the cerebellum. It is separated by the tentarium belli, but you don't have to remember that or the transverse fissure. Transverse fissure separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum. It makes up about 11% of the brain's mass. It is a large cauliflower shaped structure located dorsally to the pons and the medulla oblongata. It is inferior to the occipital lobe of the, cerebr the cerebrum. It's separated from the cerebrum by the transverse process again. The white matter within the gray, the arbor vitae, and the function is to coordinate all voluntary muscle movements, keeping them smooth subconsciously. It is responsible for skilled, controlled movements, for posture, for equilibrium and balance, uh, along with the inner ear. The nucleus, again, is a bundle of nerve cell bodies, gray matter separated by nerve fibers. Okay, let's talk about the